But today we are looking at Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. And there's a few things going on in, in this passage. And there's a couple good lessons in here, in this passage, for, for all of us that, that apply to today. So I'm going to read through the whole passage, and then we'll look at the parts of it, because each section of it has a certain lesson for us. It's Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being acclaimed by everyone. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to pro proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Doctor, heal yourself. So all we heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. He also said, I assure you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day, when the sky was shut up for, for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow at Sepharath in Sidon. And in the prophet Elijah's time, there were many in Israel who had serious skin diseases, yet not one of them was healed. Only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. This is, takes place right after the wilderness experience, the three temptations with the devil. And Jesus goes to visit his hometown of Nazareth. And rumors and stories had been spreading about him and, and had been getting back to the town about the miracles that he had been doing the, the things he was saying, um, what was happening around him, and the crowds were following him. So his family and his friends and the neighbors and the community were, were kind of curious. After hearing all this, and now Jesus is coming back to the to his hometown. I don't know how long he had been gone, but he had been gone for at least a few months, maybe even longer. You know, it, it's sort of like the, the, the person that you went to high school with or somebody that you vaguely know that goes to Hollywood and becomes a, a famous actor. 
and you always wonder about the stories that you read and, and hear about the famous actors, because you, you knew this person or knew about this person from when they, they grew up. And, and, and what you know, what you experienced as you grew up doesn't match the stories that you are hearing about this person. And so it's the same way with, with Jesus. He's coming back for a visit. And, and everybody wants to lay some type of a claim to him, no matter how small it might be. I, uh, of course, Donald Trump's always been famous, but now he's really famous. Uh, I met him back in the 80s and shook his hand uh, before he was what he is now. He was still what he was then, but, but you know, now being a, a presidential candidate. And I mentioned it to my wife, and she's like, I'm just hearing this now, and I said, well, it was when I was in college, and I was in a group, and we had to volunteer for for one of his buildings that he was was having an open house for, and uh, so now because he's so much more famous, I can say, hey, I got to shake Donald Trump's hand, but do I know him? No. It doesn't doesn't really change anything, and that's how it was like with some of the people. I said, "Oh yeah, I, Jesus was the carpenter that fixed my uh, my table way back when." And so now he's coming back, and it says he came back to Galilee under the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. See, there's, there's, there's a key here for us. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Jesus was still being led by the Holy Spirit. And that's important for us to know and remember because when we are being led by the Holy Spirit, we are doing what God wants us to do. God's not going to stop you from doing things that, that, that you want to do, things that might be relaxing, visiting with friends or going back home. God's not a cosmic killjoy, but he does expect you to be committed to him in all that you do. And so Jesus was teaching in their synagogues, being acclaimed by everyone. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So he arrives in Nazareth, he goes to teach at the synagogue on the Sabbath day, because this was Jesus' custom to attend public worship. This is something that we, as his followers, need to strive to do as well. Jesus' example was he always went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day to worship. So we have not only his example, but we also have if you need something more, we have a biblical reason from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings, as some habitually do, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we need to be concerned about each other. We need to promote love and good works. 
and we need to not stay away from worship. Why? Because coming to worship, we can encourage each other. I mean, where else are you going to get encouragement? Not from the world. Not from all the stresses and things that are going on out there. But if you come to worship, it should be a place where you get encouraged and you can encourage others. So he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Now, synagogue is a Greek word meaning assembly, and synagogues were built primarily for prayer. And they were used for, they meant two things. They meant a place for the gathering of the people, and it also meant the building to gather in. And if you've ever wondered why some churches have people stand for the Bible reading, it's tradition as we find in verse 16. Stood up to read and the people also stood up to read and listen to the word. Verse 17, it says, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. So the scroll, because they didn't have books, they were parchments rolled up, and they would unroll one, the top half, and roll up the bottom half when they got to where the passage they were looking for. And the passage that he read was taken from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in verse 20 it says, He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. So he reads, he rolls up the scroll, and he sits down. We would say he closed the book, and now they're expecting a lesson from Jesus. Because he was a visiting rabbi. And this was the tradition when a visiting rabbi came to town, he stopped in the synagogue and gave the lesson to the people for that day. And so in verse 21, he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. If you look in different versions of the Bible, there is usually a heading right at this verse. And the heading will say something like this. The year of the Lord's favor, the, the good news of deliverance, exaltation of the afflicted and or the Messiah's jubilee. Well, that term jubilee is taken from, again, the Old Testament in Leviticus 25. If you want to read the whole thing, it's a whole big long chapter that explains what the jubilee or the year of the jubilee contains. And the year of Jubilee was something that happened every 50 years. And the short version is this. In the beginning, every seventh year, the farmland was allowed to rest. That meaning there were no crops planted every seventh year. 
And every 50th year of those seven years was a year of Jubilee. This happened after seven Sabbath years. Seven times seven equals 49, rounded up 50. So this, fifth, this 50th year was when things were set right as a means of symbolically showing God's grace to his people. The slaves were set free and returned to their family. In the Old Testament, most of the slaves were, were voluntar they voluntarily sold themselves to another person to work off their debt. So after 50 years, they were set free and, and allowed to return to their families. Land that had been sold to pay off a debt was returned to the original owners and all debts were canceled. And then both men and animal were to rest. They were not to plant crops for a whole year, meaning total and utter dependence on God to supply their needs. Now, just as a, as a side note, there really doesn't seem to be much evidence that they actually did this meaning they weren't willing to trust God enough to do what God said in his word. And so now, in the New Testament, Jesus is applying this to his ministry. In verse 21, he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture, the Isaiah passage, has been fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, which we know because that's who led him back to Nazareth. He was anointed to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free the oppressed. To proclaim the year or the jubilee of the Lord's favor. And, and they liked this teaching. They were amazed by it. Yet there was some doubt. Why was there doubt? Because they did not believe Jesus, believing him to be the son of Mary and Joseph. See, he was the little boy that they had watched playing and growing up there. And Jesus is very much aware of all of this because he is being led by the Spirit. And there may have been open and, and loud whispering as well. I mean, who is this guy? Who does, who does Jesus think he is? We know who he is. Who does he think he is coming up and saying this and applying this passage of scripture to himself. And so that's why he says in verse 23 and 24, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, doctor, heal yourself. So all we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. And he also said, I assure you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. So the first thing is, Jesus knows that this grumbling, this, this whispering, this talking, this unbelief is going on, and he acknowledges it, and then he gives them an answer. See the words, doctor, heal yourself? They didn't care about the teaching or that Jesus was there as a rabbi. 
They were looking for something. They were looking for signs and miracles and wonders. That's what they wanted to see. They didn't want to hear teaching. They didn't want to see Jesus teach them. They were looking for signs and, and wonders. And God is not a cosmic genie. Rub the lamp three times and, and, and you'll get your wishes. Put in the, the right amount of coins and you'll get the jackpot. Say the right words and you'll get what you want. God may not and probably won't give you what you want. Because he says things must be in his will. So he won't always give you what you want. But God says he will give you what you need. And there is a difference between needs and want. That's what makes faith so interesting. And so he says in verse 25, But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land. See, with a, with a basic look at this verse, it's reminding them, and it reminds us of God's goodness. And then verses 26 and 27. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Sephirah in Sidon. And in the prophet Elijah's time, there were many in Israel who had serious skin diseases, yet not one of them was healed, only Naaman the Syrian. The reason they got so angry was because Jesus was telling them of God's goodness to the Gentiles. Verse 28, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. See, the Gentiles were outsiders. The prophet Elijah went outside of Israel, he bypassed all the Jewish widows, and he helped a Gentile widow in the region of Sidon. And then Jesus reminds them of the prophet Elijah who healed Naaman the Syrian of leprosy. Naaman was the commander of the, of the enemy's army, an army that wanted to destroy Israel. See, the Jewish people thought that they were God's chosen people, the only ones chosen by God, and they thought they were protected. They thought they were the only ones going to heaven. And Jesus is telling them, God's grace, God's love is bigger than the Jewish faith, the Jewish people. Because of Jesus, the Gentiles, the pagans, could and would be included in God's kingdom. It's like telling modern day Israel today, look, you see those Palestine, Palestinians over there? They're going to be in heaven. Some of them are going to be in heaven with you. And so they got angry at this. And in verse 29 it says they got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of a hill 
that the town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. I mean, they were so angry, they wanted to kill him right then and there. And so the people basically pushed him out of the synagogue to the edge of the hill where they were going to throw him over to his death. And, and my guess is that Jesus was, was talking with them or attempting to have a conversation with them as this was going on. And that's what happened until we get to verse 30. And Jesus said, that's enough. And it was. And so he walks through the crowd and he goes on his way. And there's a lesson here for us. Sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to ignore the crowd. We need to ignore the angry words and continue on our way. We need to literally, quote unquote, shake the dust off our feet, as it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, Shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. See, one of the things that we can see here is we are not going to always understand God and his ways. And the Jewish response was to get mad and not listen and not learn what Jesus said. And sometimes God reaches out to the Gentiles rather than the Jews. Sometimes God does stuff that we don't understand or expect. God is going to do the same thing. He is going to reach out to people that we may not want to reach out to. God is going to do things that we may not understand and we can't always understand the why I mean why is is one person healed and another is not why is one person who everybody considers good or great killed or dies of a disease and, and the murderer or the rapist seems to keep on living. Remember this, when we don't understand, when we are, when we are tempted to get angry, the final chapter of our lives and the lives of others has not been written. The final chapter in our lives and the lives of others has not been written. So have patience. Trust in God. Live in faith. Now the final chapter in God's story has been written. And we win. We win. But we may not always win the battles. But at the end, trusting in Jesus will get us to heaven. Trust Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit, and God's promise to us is that we will see the victory in Jesus. Trust and faith are the keys that will get us there. Amen.
Our closing hymn is number 496. Would you please stand, Victory in Jesus, number 496. Mm -hmm. 